we stray away there's nothing that he won't do again for us he will continue to come after and look for us if we stray away from him he will seek us and he will draw us back into his presence oh we serve a great and mighty God a wonderful Savior.
Once again, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Beginning to transition to what's ahead. Taking small steps to hopefully begin to have a semblance of a normal service in the weeks to come. Been asked by a number of individuals if we will maintain these live streams going forward, and it is our in intention to continue to live stream even if our services get back to the point where we can meet together corporately and collectively. I want to take a moment just to thank those of you that are watching us this morning from a distance. I know it's not only our church family here at Livingstone Family Worship Center, but I've come to the realization that there are all others that are watching us from other parts of this country. And we don't take that lightly. We don't take that for granted. We're so grateful that you have found us. It's our prayer that your experience has been a blessing to you. 
those that are watching from what I've seen, Arkansas, New Jersey, I believe Montana, California, number of different states. We simply want to say thank you for being a part of Living Stone Family Worship Center family. And we pray that once again as we go forward that you will maintain a relationship with us, that you will continue to follow us. And if this ministry has been a blessing to you over the past number of weeks, we simply want to encourage you to just let others know that we're here to serve and we're here to give you an authentic worship experience that does not compromise the Word of God. With that in mind, I'm going to ask you if you will, this is our custom here at Livingstone Family Worship Center. We have a, a few people with us this morning. I'm going to read to you a few verses that we can get right into this message this morning. Still in this series entitled, If You're Still Here, today being part six. Over the past number of weeks, we've been ministering to you about what's going on around us, what's really happening. And, and we've been in actually in the book of Revelation for the past six or seven weeks. And as I've stated, it was not my intention to, to be in this, this long. But the Spirit of God has led me to the point where I firmly believe that not only is it what I'm supposed to do, what we're supposed to do, but it is actually a mandate of God. So with that in mind, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to turn to Revelation chapter 14, beginning with verse 6. Just going to read to you just a, a couple of verses. Then we're going to get right into this morning's message. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. And it reads as follows. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give gl glory to Him. For the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Let's pray. Father, once again, we honor you as God. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to assemble here today. You brought us together through various means. And Lord, for the blessing, for the, for the blessing that you have bestowed upon us, Lord. We honor you as God. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you, Father, that we can put our trust in you. That we don't have to be overly concerned with all the elements of life, but we can genu genuinely trust in you. And Father, for those that are watching, even this morning, or those that will come and observe what is going on here in the next coming days, Father, I pray by your Spirit that you would not only be present with them, but you would speak to them with clarity in their minds. That if they have questions and, and wonder if they're abiding in fear or trepidation, Lord, that you, by your word, will bring them encouragement even today. Father, let the anointing of God be great, that I may minister these, these your words to these, your people. We magnify you. We glorify you. For we pray in Jesus' name to the glory of God. Amen, amen, and amen. Once again, you may be seated in the house of the Lord. Last week, we were in the book of Revelation chapter 14. Revealed to you a number of things that were, are going to happen in the coming tribulation period. And this morning, I'm going to simply continue to uh, bring forth this next message, simply entitled, If You're Still Here, Part 6, Babylon has fallen. And for us to have a clear understanding of, of what this really means, I, I must take you to an, an in-depth look into the Word of God. See, we, we must understand that these verses or these scriptures do not simply uh, pertain to this current generation or what is even yet to come. But in the Word of God, you understand that there is a reason for everything that happens everything that transpires. And more often than not, because we don't delve into the Word of God in its entirety, we don't have a full understanding of why we even find ourselves here. 
But I, I, want, I want to focus on, on, on the verse, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. That great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Last week I revealed to you that oftentimes in scripture there are words, types and shadows that reveal to us what they actually mean in scripture. The revelation comes from understanding the word of God. And oftentimes you find these words that you, you can't help but wonder what does this really mean. And when you come to this place where it says, she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You must understand that there is a time of judgment that will befall upon not only this world, but all the systems that have been devised or created or implemented that contradict the word of God. That there is the wine of wrath that is to come of her fornication, of being involved in a manner that, that not only contradicts the word of God, but, but in scripture reveals to us the idea of committing adultery or, or a, a spiritual immorality in the sight of God. And that's what you see here. But once again, I'm going to take you to the very first book in the word of God, that you and I may have a clearer understanding of how we find ourselves here in this portion of scripture saying that Babylon is fallen for a time that is yet to come. In the book of Genesis chapter 11, I'm going to read to you just a few verses. Beginning with verse 2, notice what it says. Genesis 11 verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone, and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Here were a group of people who determined that they would walk outside of the parameters of God. And they came with the intention of, Come, let us build ourselves a city, Notice what it says, and a tower whose, whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. We want to be known for who we are. We don't need to be led by the God that, of creation, or we don't need to be led by anyone other than ourselves. And they said, let us be scattered abroad over the, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And then in verse 5, it says, but the Lord came down to the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, indeed the people are one, and they have all one language. And this is what they begin to do. The Lord says, because the people are able to communicate and understand, notice what he says, because they have one language, this is what they begin to do. They want to build themselves a city. They want to build a tower whose top is in heaven. They want to make a name for themselves. And the Lord says, now nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. So the Lord says, come, let us go down there and confuse their language. That they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building in the city. You see, today there might be those who simply say, how is it that all these languages derived? How is it that in, in one country they speak a, 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 a language that is native to that land or, or that country and another country speaks an entirely different language? How is it that they develop these languages? Well, I'm here to remind, remind you, to you, you and reveal to you that that is the God that we serve. The Bible says that, that because of this, the, he, he confused their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. That is in the word of God. How God populated different areas of his creation with different people, different tongues, different languages. Primarily so they would not be able to communicate with one another and do what they desired to do. See, their intention is, let us, let us, let us make for ourselves, 
Let us make a name to ourselves. Let us be known for who we are. And the Bible tells us exactly what occurred. They say, we, we, will make a, a, we will make it to heaven on our terms. We will do it for our glory. We will do it our way. We will not listen to God. We will openly rebel against God and his command. And that's what these people were beginning to do. But what I want you to understand is that there are different areas that, you, or that are involved in this portion of Scripture. See, let us build a tower whose top is in heaven. Is man's own attempt to make it into the presence of God. Let us make a name for ourselves. Let us make a city for ourselves. Is man's attempt to live a life apart from God. So here are different ways in which man takes it upon themselves, in essence, to become their own God. But notice what it also means. That here in this system... We refer to it today as secular humanism, a system, a system that is devoid of the presence of God, where man determines to govern their own lives, to govern their own cities, to govern themselves. A system apart from God. But it also includes man's own attempt to create their own religious systems. Here you begin to see exactly what happened. Is in the Word of God, it reveals to us exactly what occurred. But there's even more to it than that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal to some of you today some information of how we get to this place. That there is a place that is called Babylon and what Babylon represents. You must understand how it began. Let me go back to Genesis chapter 10, beginning with verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, is Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Erech, and Akkad, and Galneh, in the land of Shinar, in the land of Shinar. So here you get the understanding that, that this man named Nimrod began to rule the kingdom of Babel. He began to oversee where it went. And throughout the history of, of, of mankind, you must understand that, that this, this desire to be led of self, to, to, to govern their own lives, to, to make heaven to heaven on their own terms, began with this man. It was Nimrod that led an attempt to build the Tower of Babel. But there's some things that we don't see in Scripture that you'll learn through various means. Upon the death of his father, Nimrod, Nimrod married his mother named Semiramis. You begin to see how, once again, outside of the parameters of God, that people will do wickedness in their own eyes. And after all of this began to occur, the, the Bible says that he, he died unexpectedly. And Semiramis began to proclaim that he ascended into heaven and became the sun god. The sun god, that is S-U-N, God. His mother, his wife. She proclaimed herself to be a goddess who came to earth in a specifically designed craft. She referred to herself as the queen of heaven, also coming to be known as the moon goddess. Nimrod being known as the sun god, and she herself proclaiming herself to be the moon goddess, the goddess of fertility. To understand what had began to happen. She came to a place where she was found with child, and she claimed that Nimrod came to her by the rays of the sun, for he was the sun god. And that he supernaturally fathered a child within her womb. A child that would come, they would come to name as Tammuz. And she would go on to say when, when the child was born, that he was reincarnated, that he became Nimrod, reincarnated. She proclaimed that she had gone down to the world of the dead, and she rescued Nimrod and brought him back. Thus began the worship of Semiramis 
the god child Tammuz, and the sun god Nimrod. There's so much information I could give you. I simply wanted to lay a foundation for how this false premise of worship began in the word of God. A number of things began to happen. But if you go to the book of Ezekiel, I want you to see Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 13. Listen to these words. He said also to me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for That is in the word of God. That is an area of scripture that I, I venture to say that most of us have never heard. But, but the, through the prophet Ezekiel, he identifies God's covenant people being at the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for the so-called God child of Semiramis and Nimrod, the sun god. So God's own covenant people began to worship these false gods. It was on to say, then said he unto me, Has thou seen this O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. The Semiramis is known by different names in the word of God. To the Israelites, she is known as Ashtoreth. To the Phoenicians, Astarte. In Babylon, she is known as Ishtar. In Assyria, she is known as Beltus. In Greece, she is Aphrodite. In Rome, she is Diana. In Egypt, she is known as Isis. In India, she is Isi. In, in China, I can't even pronounce that name, so just suffice it to say she's known as something in China. In Mexico, in Scandinavia. The premise of this false goddess is all around the world. The sun god, Nimrod. To the Israelites, he's known as Baal. To the Phoenicians, El. To Babylon, Belaz. In Assyria, Ninas. In Greece, Zeus. In Rome, Jupiter. In Egypt, Ra. In India, Vishnu. All over the word of God, these false gods have been deemed as gods. Here you understand that, that she represents, she is represented as the mother of God while hurting, holding her son in her arms. In scripture, you must understand that this form of religion is called the religion of Babylon, a form of idol worship. And when a religious system uses anything that man has created with his own hands and calls it God, it is Babylon. According to the word of God, any religion that, 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 that delves or, or abides in the areas that are outside of the parameters of God is known as Babylon. And it comes with the intention, once again, that we will make it to heaven on our own terms. We will do it our way for our glory. We, we will not listen to the God of the Bible. We will openly rebel against God and do it our way. That's just where it begins. I have a number of verses here in Scripture that I can show you what God's covenant people did. The worship of this Ashtoreth. 1 Kings 11, chap verse, chapter 11, verse 5. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after him, the detestable idol of the Amorites. Solomon, the, 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 the wisest man, the wisest king, the Bible says, went after this false goddess. In verse 33 of 1 Kings chapter 11. Because they have forsaken me and have, have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the sons of Ammon. And they have not walked in my ways, doing what is right in my sight, and observing my statutes and my ordinances as his father David did. God's covenant people now worshipping false gods. In the book of Numbers, chapter 25, verse 3. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor. And the Lord was angry against Israel. 
The Lord said to Moses, take all the leaders of the people and execute them in broad daylight before the Lord, so that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. So Moses said to the judges of Israel, each of you slay his men who have joined themselves to Baal of Peor. Number of verses that I have, I, I'm, I, I'm going to stop right there. I want you to see what is going on here. Babylon is fallen denotes a system that has not been faithful to God. God's own covenant people forsaking their God to follow after false gods, gods of idols, gods of other means to make it into heaven. Now it is pervasive today around the world. But I want you to see what, 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 what this means. Because I, I want you to, to go with me to Revelation chapter 15. And I'm going to go through these verses quickly. And this morning I'm going into, uh, in one message, encapsulated chapter 15, chapter 16, and chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. With this message entitled, Babylon Has Fallen. In the book of Revelation, I want you to understand exactly what happens. I'm just going to read this chapter to you. Revelation chapter 15. Not going to spend too much time here. I, I just want you to see how the judgment begins. After the three and a half year period of tribulation, there, there have already been 14 judgments of God that have fallen upon the world during the tribulation period. The bowls, seven bowls, seven trumpets. And now here in Revelation chapter 15, you will see the seven bowls, the, in, initially the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and here 15, the seven bowls. Let me read it, see. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them the wrath of God is complete. I, I want you to understand that in Revelation chapter 6, 6 ch chapter 6, we, hear, we read this verse, in verse 16, and said to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. We find that in Revelation chapter 6, the wrath of the Lamb. Now here in Revelation chapter 15, the Bible says, for in them is filled the wrath of God, the supreme deity, God now, now, here, notice what begins to happen. And I, I reminded you last week, uh, verse number two. And I saw it as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, they stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. Here you see those that were able to, to come through the tribulation. However, they came through with the end of their life. They were now put to death because they now determined that they would serve the true and the living God. But here is an inclination of where they were. Those that, that, that had victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark. And here they are now identified in Revelation chapter 15. But the Bible says that they sing a, a song of Moses, a servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And look what occurred. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, plagues clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, or bowls, of the wrath of God, who live forever and ever. Now, now you begin to see what, what happens here. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from His power. And no man was able to enter the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Now here come the, the seven last plagues 
that will come upon the, the world in the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. And what you must understand is that, is that, is that scholars believe that it's just not one right after the other, but rather come and they're simultaneous. And that when the next one comes, the previous one is yet in effect. So for the next period in time, you will get to this place where you see these judgments and the wrath of God falling upon the world. Understand who this is. What you will not find in these scriptures are those who have made it into the presence of God. What you find here is this is coming against a rebellious world. A world that has rejected the presence of God. A, a world that has no desire to fall under the laws of God. Those who rejected now, here they are. And all these things begin to happen. The Bible tells us exactly what occurs. Let me give you a small encapsulated version of what is to come. Revelation chapter 16, beginning with verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. And notice, notice what happens. No, notice what occurs. The very first bowl is found in verse 2. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Notice what happens here. After the mid-portion of the tribulation, when those that had received the mark of the beast, the very first ones that will feel the wrath of God are those who received the mark. The Bible says, out of his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sword came upon the men who had the mark of the beast. But notice what it says. And those who worshipped his image. Once again, there are those who say, who say no, I, I, believe that you can, I believe that you can receive the mark of the beast and, and yet be saved. I'm here to tell you that receiving the mark of the beast and worshiping his image is synonymous. It is worship of the beast. And because of that, a loathsome sore will come upon the men and the women and everyone who has received this mark. The second bowl, listen to what, look, look what happens in verse 3. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood, as of, the, of a dead man. And every living creature in the sea died. There, uh, you, you, you see, you see what, what's going on here? Every living creature dies that is living in the sea. Verse 4, then the third angel poured out his bowls on the rivers and the springs of water, and they, came, they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water saying, you are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and, was and, and who is to be, because you have judged these things. Notice, no, notice what's happening here. This here, here, now, now the Bible says it be the, 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 sea, the sea upon the sea it became, became as the blood of dead men and every living soul died. And now the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers, the fountains, and they became blood. Where do you think today this world gets its drinking water? But from the rivers and from the fountains of water. And now you see exactly the judgment that, that ultimately is conveyed to us the idea that there will be no more water to drink. And in verse 16, for they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Word worthy is not how we deem it to mean. Uh, so you are worthy of the blessings of God, or you are worthy of the promises of God. No, what this is conveying is that they are worthy, they are deserving of this punishment. Why? Because they have rejected God. They have rejected every concept of God. And now God is revealing to them who truly is God. Verse 7, And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and the power was given him unto him to scorch men with fire. All of a sudden now, the, the intensity of the heat, and now, now intensified heat from the sun. So much so that it will cause the ignition of fires all around the world. And yet the heat so hot, the heat 
that it will scorch those on the earth. The judgments of God upon a rebellious world. But look at what it says in verse 9. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God. They blasphemed the name of God. This means that, that they spoke to, to vilify, to defame. They began to speak against God, the name of God. So here there, it conveys the idea that they believe in the concept of God. They just simply refuse to worship the true and the living God. For they knew, where they, they, they shall know where this judgment will come from. They blasphemed the name of God, which has powers over these plagues. They, 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 they knew exactly where it was coming from. But notice the next portion of this verse. Revelation chapter 16, or 15, 16 verse 9. Look at how it ends in this verse. And they repented not to give him glory. Now under the judgments of God... Now men scorched with great heat. Now no water to drink. They were to drink blood. Why? Why? Because they were deserving of the punishment and the judgments of God. And in spite of knowing that it was God, the Bible says they, they will repent not to give him glory. In spite of all that is going on, they refuse to repent and give God glory. And the fifth, fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. And his kingdom was full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues for pain. Where the beast has now established his throne, darkness will fall upon them. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. And once again, and repented not of their deeds. The people during this time, their hearts will be so hardened they can acknowledge God, but that yet they will refuse to repent of their deeds. And the sixth angel, verse 12, poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and water therefore was dried up, that way, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. If something is going to transpire in the next few chapters that I'm going to lay a foundation for here, a battle that will come most of you have heard of the battle that is referred to as the Battle of Armageddon. And this sixth vial, this sixth bowl, begins to prepare the way of the kings from the east to come. And in verse 13, listen to what it says. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Understand, it goes on to say, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles. And their purpose which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle that of that great day of God Almighty. Spirits that would deceive. Spirits that would mislead. Spirits that would come against, once again, uh, the, 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 the coming, the, the Lord who will soon return now in preparation to do battle against the coming king. But notice what it says in verse 15. In the middle of this chapter of the judgments of God, you come to verse 15. And in my Bible, it is found written in red letters. So that conveys the idea that Jesus himself is speaking these words. In the middle of the judgments of God, in, in, in chapter 16 of Revelation, these words can be found. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments lest he walk naked and they see his shame in the middle of this chapter Jesus interjects that verse and he says blessed is he that watches blessed is he that pays attention blessed is he that is aware of what's going on and I've said this so many times where are the churches today that are watching where are all the churches today that are aware of what's going on? Where are they? Many of us observe and we hear them and we see the message. As a matter of fact, many of you today will go and observe many of these large churches all around the world. And I want you to ask yourself, where is the message to the body of Christ to watch? 
to prepare, to understand that Jesus is coming. Where is that message today? Here Jesus says, blessed is he who watches. Today, 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 it seems like the, the inherent message of the day is God is in control. Yes, we know God is in control. Trust God. Yes, we know we can trust God. Pray. If you pray and you praise, you'll find a semblance of peace. That is the message today. But where is the message? Warning the people of the impending judgment that is coming. Verse 16. And they gathered them together in a place called in Hebrew. Let me read to you this next portion of scripture. I want you to see how pervasive the judgments of God are. And the seventh angel poured out his vial, his bowl into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. The bowls, the vials now poured forth. Judgment fallen all upon around the world. And look at what it says in verse 18. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake. Such as was not seen since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. An earthquake that impacts the entire world. And that great city was divided into three parts. That great city. Now, oftentimes in scripture, that great city, or, or when there's reference to a spe specific city, generally in the word of God, it reveals, or, or it, it, it's referring to Jerusalem. Could it be that even Jerusalem, the city of peace, will also experience the wrath of God? But notice what happens in verse 19. I want you to hear this because this is so powerful. It says here, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Once again, it's so easy to just simply read that verse and not recognize its gravity. And the cities of the nations fell. All around the world, cities being destroyed. All around the world because of this last or, or these judgments. Tokyo will be destroyed. Delhi, India will be destroyed. Shanghai, China. Sao Paulo, Brazil. Mumbai, India. Mexico City, Osaka, Japan, Cairo, Egypt, uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, Istanbul, Turkey, uh, Lagos, Nigeria, Manila in the Philippines, Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, Los Angeles in the United States, Dallas, Texas in the United States, all the great cities, Moscow in Russia, Paris in France, Singapore in Singapore. Name every great city in the world. And the Bible says that those cities, those nations will fall. All around the world. The Bible says Babylon is fallen. Babylon is fallen. A system that is opposed to God. Through his creation, he's all he, he has endeavored to do is to grab the attention of those who would respond. But there comes a time where it must all come to an end. The Bible says that every island fled away. And the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men. 
Each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Each hailstone about the weight of a talent. We can go outside during a hailstorm and we can find a, an inch, a, a hailstone the size of a golf ball and we think that we've seen something amazing. You must understand that in the Hebrew term the, for talent, it represents the highest or the heaviest weight measure in Hebrew. In Greek, all the talent, the ta biblical scripture reveals that a talent is a 75 pound hailstone. Not just one. Each hailstone. Each hailstone. You just imagine the devastation all around the world because of the judgment of God. But where are the watchmen of God? Where are they? Chapter 17, I know I'm going fast. I know I'm going quickly. I just want to get all this in, this message, because it all represents Babylon, systems that are opposed to God. Go with me to Revelation chapter 17. I'm going to read through this fully once again. give you some important areas of scripture and help you understand what is transpiring. Revelation chapter 16 is how God deals with a re rebellious people. Revelation 17 is how God will deal with a rebellious religious system. If you recall in Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 there's the account of another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. He causes them to worship the first beast. To bow down and worship the first beast. He had two horns like a lamb. We know the reference of a lamb in the word of God always refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. We had power and authority like a lamb, a religious system, a religious system that looks authentic, but yet it speaks like a dragon. Let me re reveal to you in Revelation chapter 17 what this means. This chapter of scripture might offend some of you that are watching. Some of you might not like what I reveal to you in the next few minutes. But I must be about the Father's. And I must reveal the truth. I'm going to ask you, if you will, to take the time to read it its entirety for the sake of brevity of time. But from the book of Revelation, chapter 17. I'm going to give you seven, six very important verses that will help you to identify the whore of Babylon. Notice, no, no, notice what it says. Notice what it says. I'm just going to begin, begin reading. Uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 17, I'm going to read the first verses. I'm going to get into these verses. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked to me, saying to me, Come and I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Those verses convey the idea of a religious system. Now notice what he says, a great harlot. Remember, the reference of harlot is a religious system who sits on many waters, who sits in the area. Remember, waters mean people. So sits in a variety, a large area of, of the world among people with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, a religious system that the kings of the earth will validate and partake of her false teachings. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. A religious system that is so influential all around the world like no other. 
says here that, that the inhabitants of the earth, the entire earth was impacted by and drunk, were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now again, let me give you these six verses. I want you to understand exactly what, what, what occurs here. Remember what it says. I saw a woman in, in, in verse 3. I saw a, a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a gold cup of full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. These verses, number one, that I want to give you in the Word of God. It's coming, I will show you the judgment of the great whore, great harlot, who sits on many waters. Notice, notice what it says here. Because God has intended to judge this system of belief. He says, I will, in verse 7, but the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Once again, the, the, the leaders of the world now supporting a religious system, a, a system that is posed, opposed from God. And now you, what, what I want you to understand is exactly what, what, what it says. Because on verse number 5, it, it says, I will show you on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. A religious system that has impacted the entire world. And in verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. First, the Bible tells us that there will be judgment against this religious system. It tells us that it identifies as, uh, this system as the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. In verse 6, it tells us it's a religious system. I saw the woman that was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs. It's a religious system that through the church age, that is a system that has, that has killed the saints of God and, and is drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. A religious system that is found guilty of this very thing. Number 4, verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. Listen to what this says. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Verse 9. One more again. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. The woman, a religious system that sits somewhere that is referred to as the seven heads are the seven mountains on which a woman sits. Here, a religious system that is identified by being in a place that has seven mountains or seven hills. We could determine where that city is. But if you're really interested, I'm going to allow you to search it out yourself. The city of seven hills. Search it out. You'll see. Verse 15, then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. The waters, a religious system that is influential all around the world. And who you saw is that great city, verse 18, which reigns over the kings of the earth. A religious system that is in existence today that abides on the city of seven hills or seven mountains. That is influential all around the world. That when this leader speaks, the world listens. It's a system that is supported by the kings of the earth. It is a system that conveys the idea that there, is, there are multitude ways to make it to God. It is a system of inclusion that it doesn't matter what your faith is. As long as you believe in God, you can make it into the presence of God. But you remember, that is Babylon. That is Babel. That is man determining how you make it to God, not how God says you make it to me. 
And there is a system today that falls under these parameters. You want to know? Search it out. You'll find it. But something happens when this system of belief no longer serves its purpose. Just notice what happens in verse 17. Oh, no, that, that's the wrong verse. In verse 15 of Revelation chapter 17. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot and make her desolate and naked. Eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put into it into their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind and to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. Here it is. And the woman who you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Revelation chapter 16, the wrath of God falls upon a rebellious world. Revelation chapter 17 involves every religious system that is opposed to the word of God. Every religious system. I don't need to name them. Every system that says that Jesus is not God is a religious system that will fall into the judgment of God. Every denomination that does not profess Jesus to be God will fall under the judgment of God. Chapter 18, real quickly, I'm going to convey to you what's going on here. Chapter 18 of the book of Revelation not only continues the judgment against the woman on the beast. Just notice what, notice what, it, what it says in, in, in verse, verse 1 of chapter 18 of the book of Revelation. After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. An angel coming that, that his, he, he has illumination, that he can be seen. And notice what he says. And he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen and is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of luxury. Chapter 18 deals with a world economic system that has shunned God. You can read it. I, I simply don't have time to read it all. But you'll notice what happens. Because the Bible tells us exactly what occurs. Drop with me to verse 9 of Revelation chapter 18. The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. Revelation chapter 18 deals with the judgment of every world power, of every world economic system, of every system of belief that is contrary to the Word of God. And it shows you exactly what occurs. There is the judgment of God that falls upon the earth. And in verse 21, as the worship team comes, look at what happens. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. The sound of harpists, musicians, flutists, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft shall be found in you anymore. The sound of a millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. The light of the lamp shall not shine in you anymore. 
the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants, merchants were the great men of the earth. For you, by your sorcery, all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of all who were slain in the earth. The title of this message is if you're still here, part six, Babylon has fallen. Today we live in a world that is opposed to the things of God. Religious systems that are trying to make their own way into heaven. Validating their own systems of belief by claiming everyone is going to heaven. Yet it contradicts the word of God. Today we live in a world where it's all about self, accumulation, what we achieve and what we attain. We've all heard of Wall Street. We've all heard of all these different areas where the world wants to be governed by how much wealth it possesses. God allowed the nation to control their own destiny. God allowed the people to determine would they pursue the living God. In the Word of God, once again, we don't have to speculate. We don't have to guess. The Bible says that, that, that God has established a plan for anyone who will respond. Today, we are yet in position to receive those promises of God. Today, while the church is yet on earth, you and I have the opportunity to respond to the call of God. If you've never allowed Jesus to become the Lord of your life, I want to implore you, don't let this just be words. It's my prayer, it's our prayer that you will respond to the Lordship of Christ before it's too late. The Bible says that this is soon going to come to an end. Babylon has fallen, says that the people who rebel against God will be destroyed. Babylon has fallen tells us that any, every religious system that is opposed to the true tenets of the Word of God shall be destroyed. Babylon has fallen that any way of trying your way, to earn your way to heaven or to simply accumulate what does this life have to give me or offer me shall be destroyed. But I'm here to remind you that this is not where the story ends. I'm here to remind you that next week to allow you to know that we're getting close. We're getting close to chapter 19. Next week, I'm going to remind you and reveal to those of you who don't know that the King is coming. Jesus will be coming soon. So in spite of all these messages that I've been trying to present to you of what to, if you're still here, what will happen? I'm here to encourage those of you who are now in the body of Christ and those who yet have an opportunity to join us. That Jesus is coming soon. I don't know about you, but I look forward to that day. Brother Bill, I look forward to that day when we see Jesus face to face. I don't know if there's anyone out there watching this morning that says, I cannot wait to that day that I see Jesus, that I see my Jesus face to face. He's coming soon. He's coming soon. Are you ready? Father, we honor you once again. We pray that today we have honored you, given you glory. That as we teach the people of God, that they would be encouraged. But not only encouraged to listen, but they would be encouraged to respond. Lord, we are watchmen on the wall. We will warn the people of impending judgment and danger. Spirit of the living God, take our words. Spread them among the people, Lord, oh, among the many waters that they will know that Jesus is coming soon. Father, we honor you. We give you glory. We praise your name. As we pray in Jesus' name to the glory of God. Amen. Amen. And amen.
Yeah.